Welcome in to the PFF NFL Podcast. Steve Pelizzolo back here with Sam Monson. It's always a crazy week in the NFL, Sam. Another crazy week two in the books. Yes. <laughs> You're not good at this uh, early podcast banter this morning. You were in another terrible mood today. Well, that was... I, I, there was... I had less room to take that over than usual, Steve. I'm going to question the way that was thrown to me. Open-ended. It's an open-ended discussion. Okay, let me let me start with our talking points, Sam. Okay. okay. You doing okay, by the way? Because you seem miserable. Not miserable, but, you know, it's Monday morning after a long Sunday sitting in the office doing live TV hits across the ocean. Oh, I know. It's tough. Then watching, you know. It's tough more getting those live night. TV hits then across the ocean. Early in the morning. Trekking your way in through a gridlocked 471 because over here nobody can drive in the traffic. <sighs> I'm just saying. Sad, Monday morning. Sad trombone music Monday for Sam mornings. here. Tough job you have here. Right. Watching football all the time. I'm sure our listeners can really relate to you. I would hope so. This is like when you, when you talk about some uh, rich broadcasters that you know can't relate to the people. Well, That's there's a little right bit now. of a difference complaining about like long nights and traffic than there is, you know, <laughs> making opera references that everybody can get. That's all I'm. I'm at the country club and I got to wait three minutes to get to the 18th hole. It's tough. Yeah, rough. All right. So, my big takeaway from week two is the pass games, of course. Um, it was just all about the pass games. Pass games exploded all over the place. I mean, the stats are just ridiculous. You have stuff like Kirk Cousins throws a game-ending interception, but because Clay Matthews didn't gently put him on the turf, the game continues. People were up in arms over that hit as if it was any way more egregious than everything they've been calling since that rule came into place. Like uh, That was no, pretty much a timing, textbook. But it's more like the timing but of it. But it was a yeah. textbook example of the stuff that is no longer allowed. Like it's if you want to complain about the fact that that is no he longer spiked right. him though he was on the si- he was on his side he so drove him into the ground as much as anybody oh, has driven so. anyone into the ground since they made that hit a rule like so, he literally like he tackled it was a perfect form tackle that you can't make on a quarterback anymore so but Brady got hit by one with Ngakwe where he was Ngakwe kind of had him on the side yeah and it looked like he may have spiked him a little bit and then the, they went to the ref and said actually no because he was on the side. It wasn't that bad. I'm like, all right, okay, that makes sense. And it looked exactly like the Clay He was Matthews on his one. side in so much as when you're tackling somebody with your shoulder, you're automatically on the side of a guy. But he basically drove him into the ground. Anyway. Which is, like, it's ridiculous. The idea that, that is a penalty anymore, or now, is absurd. But it is. And that's, I mean, it was a pretty clear example of that penalty. Anyway, passing stats as a whole, just uh, glancing at it this week, there were... 23 quarterbacks with a passer rating over 90. 23 out of 30 that I'm looking at right now. Two of the guys who did not make that threshold, rookies, Sam Darnold and Josh Allen. Uh, So 23 guys over 90. 17 guys over 100. 12 guys over 300 passing yards. Three over 400 passing yards. It's just Uh, ridiculous. 10 guys with two or more touchdowns. Yeah. Yeah. So just so look, it, it, this happens a lot in September. Though last year at this time, I, th- I think we were talking about defenses being a little bit better than expected, pass games being down a little bit. But early in the season, the pass games are generally up. They'll get a little bit worse as the season goes. But this is still, in broad terms for the NFL, the last 10 to 15 years, continuing to get to become more of a passing league from a statistical standpoint. I don't think the quarterback play is magically better. I mean, even when you just look at uh, basic PFF grades, it's still a pretty even distribution of guys at the high end, guys at the middle end, guys at the low end. And like Ben Roethlisberger, a fascinating breakdown here. His PFF grade was bad. It's, it's, you, you see it in premium stats. It's, gonna, it's bad. And he threw for 452 and three touchdowns and no interceptions. Yeah, I mean, well, you've got to bear in mind that the Chiefs' secondary is horrendous. It's terrible. Um, the Chiefs generally are going to be in a shootout every single week this season, I suspect. First first play of the game, I think, uh, Roethlisberger overthrows James Washington deep down the left sideline, who just ran right past Steven Nelson as if he wasn't there. That could have been you know, a big touchdown to open the game. That wasn't a unique thing in that game. Roethlisberger had a bunch of misses on relatively routine passes. So, so as he much could as have he thrown was, for 600. Yeah, yeah. As much as he was able to rack up a lot of yardage, given how often they were throwing the ball in that game, he had a lot of misses. 
Uh, so just looking at Roethlisberger, too, this week, uh, only 40% or 60% of his yards came after the catch. So, again, just one of the big things we do here at PFF is splitting up the stats from what actually happened on the field. Roethlisberger, a good example of that this week, has not played well two straight weeks. Um, perhaps concerning for the Steelers moving forward. Let's get to the big stories, though. Let's start with the other side of the ball in that game. Patrick Mahomes, the Kansas City Chiefs offense. We talked about, you just mentioned the Chiefs defense is bad. The offense is incredible right now. We suspected it might be, but Patrick Mahomes still, you know, taking the league by storm and and just kind of confirming what a lot of people thought coming into the season, that they're going to be tough to stop. Yeah, he looked really, really good. I mean, it's everything the, the narrative coming into the season was that everything we'd seen so far from Mahomes was good we just haven't seen enough of it so that right. in and of itself is a question mark um, you're never sure how a guy's going to perform when you're dealing with such small sample sizes that was the Jimmy G story as well that's you know we've only seen a few games is that him or is that just a good run of games that we expect to dissipate and go back down to earth and even with the Deshaun Watson thing, it was the same kind of deal. Like, when you're dealing with that smaller number of games, you just you still don't know. And I guess the same thing is true with Mahomes as well. We still don't know because we're only dealing with two more games in addition. But those two games have been pretty spectacular. I mean, the box score numbers speak for themselves. He's got 10 touchdowns over two weeks. He's almost 50% of the way there to his over-under on touchdown passes for this season. I think his over-under was 22. He's at 10 after 10. two games. Um, and it's not so much that he's he's being prolific, but it's how it's happening. Like the first game was against the Chargers secondary, which we ranked as the number one unit in the league heading into the season, given their coverage skills, given the players they have back there. Mahomes carved them up. The Steelers, I mean, they very much don't have the number one secondary in the league, but Mahomes picked them to pieces as if they weren't even playing. Like every time they ran zone they ran cover two cover three Mahomes just fired the ball into the the hole in the zone like it wasn't there I mean this was Aaron Rodgers like stuff great arm put the ball exactly where it needed to be diagnosed the open man simply he looked absolutely spectacular in that game then you couple that with the weapons that the Chiefs have you know Tyreek Hill obviously but Travis Kelsey Sammy Watkins Kareem Hunt looked good running in the backfield when they needed to, to hand the ball off this Chiefs offense looks absolutely spectacular. And the only thing that makes that even more entertaining is that they have one of the worst coverage units in the league. So they are going to be like watching an arena football league team every single week. They're going to average 30 plus points a game on offense and they're going to average 30 plus points a game on defense. Yeah, I mean, it really is going to be the most entertaining football if you're into that high octane offense and bad defense every single week uh tons of credit to Mahomes I want to follow up on something uh Chris Brown Mr. Smart Football on Twitter was Mm -hmm. was bringing up today about how how comfortable Mahomes looks in empty sets so I figured I'd check out the numbers on that so far through two weeks uh 18 dropbacks and empty sets he's 11 for 15 for 175 and three touchdowns passer rating of 151.4 has two big time throws and I think that to me that's the story with Mahomes I I know people have cited he had low interception totals or low interception percentage at Texas Tech a lot of that's you know screen based I mean throw that many screens your percentage will be low Mm -hmm. but he did have a high number of turnover worthy plays at Texas Tech he did take a lot of crazy risks some worked some didn't that's why he makes big time throws he yeah throws turnover worthy throws through two weeks though no turnover worthy throws the other thing is when you watched him at Texas Tech, he played almost 100% outside of the structure of the offense. Like everything he did was just taking off, like Russell Wilson style, just running around making something spectacular happen. Now, he still does that occasionally, right. but he's playing like an NFL quarterback right now. Right. He is operating from the pocket, from within the structure of the offense, and looking extremely comfortable doing it. Now, he still does the same thing when he plays outside, which is when he's running around, he's looking to go deep. Like, that's, I think, his single biggest calling card is a lot of guys, when they're running around, they're just looking for any opening. Sure. When Mahomes runs around, he's looking to fire 60 yards downfield to somebody. And when you have Tyreek Hill, that's a much better option than normal. Um, But I think heading into that game, like, the first week, his average depth of target when he was pressured was, like, 22. (laughs) Like, it's his average depth of target was high to begin with, but when he was pressured... It went, it skyrocketed. Like when he 
is hurried and running around. He just wants to airmail at 60 yards over your defense. So a lot of people like to make comparisons and all that stuff. And look, we're not, I'm not doing this based off of the fact that he's statistically out of his mind so far. But from a style standpoint, the ability to win inside and outside the pocket, to create big plays outside the pocket, the quick release that he has, even just on screen passes and the unique way and off that he throws the ball off platform. Is he the closest thing to Aaron Rodgers that we've seen? Oh, God. No, we're, we're bringing back the comparison. We're reclaiming the comparison. Look, Aaron Rodgers stylistically <laughs> might look like Mike Glennon to some. Mm, sure. He might look like Mike Glennon to some. Okay. To me, what I'm saying is there's a couple, there's some things in Mahomes' game that are similar to Aaron Rodgers. I'm not saying he will be one of the best quarterbacks of all time for sure. Look, the, yeah, there, his ability, his arm is one of the top five in the league. His arm is probably one of the best two, three in the league. Yeah, when you when you take all of the different ways that you throw the ball and all yeah. that into consideration. That, I mean, that preseason pass, we saw the 70-yard thing to Tyreek Hill was spectacular. He has the ability to do some pretty special things with his arm. That's very Aaron Rodgers-like. Rodgers' arm is one of his most spectacular attributes for a guy that does an awful lot of things well. Right. He probably doesn't get enough credit for his arm, which has become pretty spectacular over the years. That's a good point. Um, so that part is very similar. I think Rodgers is inherently a much more cautious quarterback than Mahomes in terms of the, the, uh, the turnover where he plays that you talked about before. Now Mahomes, like you said, hasn't thrown one yet, but probably will and probably will throw more than Rodgers does. That's fair. Um, I, there are some similarities between the two. Um, like I said, the ability to just sit back there and carve up a defense was pretty spectacular. He did some very Aaron Rodgers things in that game. Okay, let's. We have to discuss Ryan Fitzpatrick in the Tampa Bay Bucks. Um, pie on my face for calling their regression too early. I just he think has to regress at some point. It would be pretty hilarious if Ryan Fitzpatrick put together the season that you keep expecting Jameis to have, and you just got high end peak Ryan Fitzpatrick for the whole year. Yeah, Jameis comes back. He's told to take a seat on the bench. He's not even getting his job back. Ryan Fitzpatrick just plays like an MVP for sixteen games. It would be amazing. Wouldn't it? This two-game stretch of his is right up there. I mean, when you look at what Foles did in the NFC Championship in the Super Bowl last year. So this is the thing, as, right? It's you know, two-game stretches. It's a two-game stretch that is, it's absolute high-end Fitzpatrick. And we talked before. It's high-end anybody. But we talked before about uh, Nick Foles maybe having the widest spectrum of any quarterback in the league in terms of what he could be on a given day. It goes from like Super Bowl MVP against a really good team to utter disaster and you know could be anywhere in between fitzpatrick is right up there in the same spectrum he you could get pretty spectacular stuff from from fitzpatrick or you could get a quarterback grading in the 20s like he could be disaster or great on any given week sure so again you're sort of so two games back to back of high-end fitzpatrick now what does that mean are you do we still expect him to be good or is are we just two weeks into a sample size that's going to swing back to being a guy grading in the 20s again so when we when we talk about anomaly seasons in recent years you'd have to call cam newton's mvp season an anomaly pure at this point it was one elite grading season out of what six or seven now mm -hmm. where he's been pretty average Fitz and Carson Palmer's 2015 massive he wasn't outlier. but he wasn't like Carson wasn't at, like he but him and Newton were both good mm -hmm. throughout their good grades and they went to spectacular in 2015 Fitz is the epitome of average to below average when it comes to PFF grading we've got years in, at 51 we have years at 65 years at 68 60 the the year in 2015 that he had uh where he was really good he had 31 touchdowns and that was playmakers brandon marshall eric decker he was chucking them up getting away with a bunch of stuff the stats looked great and then he imploded at the end of the season absolutely imploded at the end of the season there's not much of a track record that suggests that he keeps this going no uh that season though is interesting because because it was so receiver driven his receivers that year were great. We talked about Fitzpatrick having a this YOLO pass propensity that he will just throw the ball up in the air as much as anybody. And yeah. when you have two receivers that will win a lot of those contested catches, that's going to make you start to look really good, even when you haven't been doing anything different than you've been doing before. That's why you had 31 touchdowns. Yeah, there, yeah. you've just got receivers that are going to make those plays. Um, 
the Bucks we've talked about for a couple of years, they've had really good receivers. They just have never been able to put it together consistently. So now he's putting the ball up in the air and you've got Deshaun Jackson 10 yards wide open and you've got Mike Evans winning those contested catches. Like suddenly you've got receivers that can make those plays again for the, probably the first time since that Jets year. So, you know, maybe he's going to start, maybe he's going to look a lot better because of those receivers. And then it's the case of just how long you can get any kind of high-end Fitzpatrick going before an inevitable implosion comes. Here's what I think is hilarious. Do you remember 2014 when he was with Houston? That was his best year from a PFF standpoint, 74.4 grade, Mm -hmm. eight yards per attempt, 17 touchdowns on only 312. He was good statistically, 95.3 passer rating. So it was his best year statistically, best year PFF style, and the Texans benched him. Yes. For Ryan Mallett, I believe. And at the time, you know, people like to say, oh, PFF, maybe maybe your grades are off or whatever. I really think the Texans were like, that's it. We've hit Fitzpatrick peak. Like they really treated it the opposite of what most people do. Most people are like, "Oh, he's playing well. We got to roll with him." They said he's playing well. This will never last. Let's just let's just sell while we can. Yeah, sell high, sell they high. Sold high. Th- 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 that was his best year in the NFL by all accounts, and he got benched. What's always intrigued me though is that it is possible in football to have a season of outlier play. Yeah, because so, the season in itself is yeah, it's short is for short, a start, yeah. but. Sure. It, it it almost it's there's like a hard stop at either end of it. So you think Brett Favre in 2009, like the guy either side of that was not the same player that he was in 2009. And even all the way through 2009, everyone was saying the wheels are coming off this. Like he's hitting a wall at some point. When does he go back to being late era Brett Favre? Like when does he stop being this MVP candidate guy? And it really didn't happen until that last play of the NFC Championship game or that that interception intended it uh, to, for Sidney Rice. Like, he kept it going for the entire season. Then there was, like, a hard stop at the end of it. So, like, as much as I mock your idea that Jameis Winston is going to put together a season like that, it does happen. The Brett Favre thing, Carson Palmer, Cam Newton, 2015, all these outlier seasons – exist as solid seasons they don't exist as you know a run of games that went from one end of the year to the start of the next year and they exist as like a solid one block entity so as much as we're saying okay it's two games it's fitzpatrick he's probably swinging back the other way at some point it's it is possible that he continues and has just one crazy insane season yeah, that it, is peak Fitzpatrick. But all those guys that you mentioned too have the profiles for those breakout seasons. They're vol- you need they're to all- be, yeah, you need to be a volatile guy to start with. Right. Like a you're not going three. When we, if you guys look at the, our QB clustering stuff, cluster three quarterbacks are the guys that aren't elite, but they've got the high variance play. And in any given year, it could be really good or really bad. Yeah, you're not going from just a like hyper conservative bad quarterback to being randomly amazing one year. That's not happening. I, I, I still also get back to this point because it's such a passing league. And 2015 was the year that I started to like really buy into this whole notion of just how important playmakers are. And I know it sounds real simple on the surface, but if you truly do surround a guy that's in the middle tier, and when you rank quarterbacks, you could put fit, you'll, uh, quarterbacks 11 through 28 are almost interchangeable in today's NFL. Mm-hmm. And it, you could take any one of those quarterbacks, and if you put – a whole bunch of really good playmakers over there, you can get some really good results. So when you have a guy like Mike Evans who can go up and get the ball and Chris Godwin breaking out, Adam Humphreys in the slot, Deshaun Jackson a deep threat, O.J. Howard and Cameron Braid at tight end, wow, it, there's a lot to play with there. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's a very hard game to try and isolate individual performances in as much as that's the thing we try and do. There are so many moving parts that make it really hard, so that's why you have to try and dive into all the advanced stuff and right. the bigger picture trends that we keep track of as well. So there was a play last night in the Dallas-New York Giants Sunday Night Football game that highlighted the kind of the real fine margins of this stuff perfectly. Um, you hear all the time about receivers needing to work their way back to the quarterback um, you know, to make the catch or whatever. There was a play that uh, Dak Prescott completed to Cole Beasley. It was a quick out. And Cole Beasley ran the route and then came back like two yards uh, vertically towards the quarterback. And if he hadn't done that, it was probably getting picked off by the outside corner who was breaking back in towards it. But Beasley ends up basically cutting him off by coming vertically back across his path, makes the catch. Like that play there is basically him deciding to work back to the quarterback is probably the difference between converting on, I think it was third down, or an interception. Like a pick, or maybe even a pick six, given the angle the cornerback was taking. Yeah. So the wide receiver's decision 
to work back a couple of yards vertically is the difference between making your quarterback look good and making him look like an idiot for putting that pass in the air. Like, those are the kind of things that receivers can do to influence quarterback play. And most of the time, guys watching aren't even looking at that. They're just saying, well, that's a terrible pass. He's throwing it straight to the cornerback. Or right. what a great ball. He fit that into a window for a, a first down conversion on third, you know, third and medium. Well, like those are the differences that you're talking about there. That when you put in a macro level, that's the, the difference. We add in three really good receivers to three average guys. If you have, I don't know, if that happens twice a game for each guy over 16 games, you're talking about like 50 plays in a season that are able to swing between very bad and very good on the spectrum that make that's a huge difference for your perception of the quarterback and that's why i think with quarterback play it, so much is reliant on the quarterback or on the on the playmakers because i mean even just the way a guy runs a deep route you know keeping your line this is one thing when zach's going through all the quarterback great uh, grading a lot of times plays that look like easy overthrows he's really keen to watch the way the receipt does the receiver get slowed up does he take a bad line does he show an inside release and then take it outside and the quarterback sees the inside and he's thrown in response to that there's so many things that happen in a game that you just can't really see until you until you watch the tape after so the two other things we need to talk about with fitzpatrick one his post-game outfit which is... I haven't seen anybody cover that. One of the most spectacular things I've ever seen in my life. Um, a friend of mine, Ro Murphy, tweeted that it, it was like if Conor McGregor had gone to Harvard. <laughs> that was that was the look he was going for. It was That was pretty spectacular. Ro, Ro tweets me every now and again. Does he? Yeah. Good for Ro. I like Ro. Yeah. Um, the other thing was, did you see his beard kiss with... Uh, I did. Who was it? It was one was of the linemen. Ali? No. It was one of the other linemen. Uh can't remember anyway evan smith yes evan smith he uh after presumably doing something good pulled up the helmet little beard kiss with evan smith i've never seen that before fitz, i didn't know that was a thing but fitz has good personality man he's a former colleague mm. we worked together back in the day the uh, super bowl preview show with nbc former colleague fitz i hate trashing him over here but you know listen we talked a lot about context leading to stats and all that stuff i let's just say this fitzpatrick has earned these stats so far yeah he's earned the ridiculous numbers that he's put up uh 96.5 grade right now in pff he's earned it every single throw nine talked about talked about mahomes not throwing a turnover worthy throw even though fitz has one interception we have him with zero turnover worthy throws and nine big time throws to lead the nfl by three he's i think three more than anyone else i think it's fun i mean he's got two games of spectacular play blake bortles played really well yesterday against the patriots let's discuss the jacks okay the patriots um Here's they lost, Steve, the Patriots. I know that. They lost in this game. So this game, the Jaguars last year in the AFC Championship played probably two and a half or three quarters of just pretty perfect football for going up against the Patriots. Controlled the clock, played good defense, Bortles made, you know, made easy throws, made, simple, you know, made things simple for Bortles. They did the same thing yesterday, but instead of folding in the fourth quarter and losing and becoming more conservative, they kept their yeah. foot on the pedal. They stayed aggressive. They learned the lesson. They really did. It was, it was extremely well executed. There seemed to be a point in that game as well where the Patriots basically just went, you know what, the hell with it. We're not winning this one. Let's just scale it back. They almost stopped trying late in the game. There was one drive late in the game. I think the Jags had just gone up by... Well, the third, the third quarter, there was, a, there was a point where the Jags took half the third quarter. Yeah, but then they, they scored at the end of one of these drives, and the Patriots basically ran three times in response and punted the ball away. Oh, that was when right. they were like three scores down yeah. at the end. Of yeah. So I think but there the, was no the bigger, attempt whatsoever to actually claw that back. It was just like, this is done. So here's where I think the bigger turning point was. There is a point where the, the Patriots are down, and then they become the Patriots, and they start to come back, and they make plays or whatever. But early in the third quarter, the Jaguars go down and score. They take half the quarter to mm -hmm. do it, and that was big. They just kept converting third down after third down, and Bortles just looked so comfortable in the pocket, ran for first downs when he needed to. When they had man coverage, he did a good job of recognizing it and saying, "I'm gonna if I just get out of the pocket, they're not going to stop me. He took one big hit by Stephon Gilmore. Gilmore made a nice play, but yeah. other than that, he ran for first downs. So they just they drive down, they take up half the quarter, and then the Patriots go three and out. And Brady over, uh, overthrows Dorsett on third and five. And there is a point where Brady it seems like he gets a little frustrated with the game flow and what he has out there, and he just chucks it deep. That, that's what it felt like. And then the Jags get the ball back, and they're just in control other than that 
the one little interception made it feel like, uh oh, here come the Patriots again. Lucky interception, here they come. But the Jags just stayed on it and they kept passing when they should have been running, in theory. And I loved the aggressiveness. They did learn their lesson and they won. They did. And no uh, Leonard Fournette didn't make any difference whatsoever. So th- the story of the entire weekend, right? You didn't hear anything about any running backs. I think it was uh, our friend Eric Edholm said there was three running backs over 84 yards at one point. No. It, it didn't matter. It yeah. doesn't matter. No Cam Robinson didn't make any impact whatsoever. He got bull rushed um, into a knee injury. He did. Like he got, he was bad enough that he got beaten by something that wasn't Adrian Claiborne's one move. Hmm. That's yeah. not good. Like even Chaz Green was only beaten by the one move. Okay, he was beaten by it 17 times, but it was only one. Only one move. Like, Cam Robinson basically folded up so badly that he injured himself in a bull rush. That's not great. Um, But the two running backs, no drop-off whatsoever from Leonard Fournette. If anything, an upgrade. Yeah, it's an Um, an upgrade because of what they could do in the pass game. Poor old Le'Veon Bell sitting on the sideline watching, or not at the sideline, sitting at home on his couch watching James Conner pull in Odell Beckham Jr. type catches down the sideline. Now, granted, it was incomplete, but still. You're looking at that and you're saying, all right, Maybe he can run the ball okay between the tackles, but he's not the receiver I am. Soars one-handed. Ah, yeah, okay. That's a problem for this negotiation. Um, But so getting on to the Jags, Bortles actually played really well. What's fun, though, is that everyone wants to be like, okay, everything's changed. Bortles is good now. Fitzpatrick's amazing. We did this last year. We did this last year. I, so don't get caught up. Somebody asked me, you know, do I not believe in this idea that a quarterback can be better now that his weapons are better and he's third year in, in the system or whatever? My response to that was, I believe in Occam's razor. And the simplest, the most likely explanation to me is that a highly volatile quarterback had one really good game, then a bad quarterback became good over, a, over an offseason. Yeah, and look, I I don't want to say I don't I don't think Bortles is a bad quarterback. Oh, I hate bad quarterback. I, I was not. I hate he throwing really the word is. bad around. Well, because look, I think in the I really think in the NFL right now don't. there's not a lot of bad quarterbacks. Don't do it. There's not. Don't do it. Don't be the guy that's no, like you're, you're the in one. the NFL. You're not a bad quarterback. No, I'm not saying it like that. I, there's been plenty of times. Look, we went back and graded 2006 and 2007. There was there were weeks where there were 15 legitimate bad quarterbacks starting. I'm saying right now in today's NFL. I said this before the season. Out of the 32 teams, how many teams are very unhappy with their quarterback situation? Yeah, not that many, but that doesn't mean they're not bad. I mean, people aren't people are No, you're just people are not dissatisfied by their quarterback situation because they have a guy they believe is better than he is. Can you just Blake Bortles, stop living in extremes for a second? Lake Bortles PFF grades over the years 46, 67, 57, 69. And now this year he's at a seventy point nine. That's not. That's not bad. It kind of is. It's, it's not, two average years and two bad years. That's not bad. That's since his rookie season. That's halfway between average and bad. No, you're out of your mind. You cannot. That, that's three average seasons after a bad season. It's two. It's three seasons, seasons that essentially land in the in the average group. It's two average seasons after a bad season and another pretty bad season. No. He's not a good quarterback. That's a, there's a difference between not good and bad. He's a pretty bad quarterback. And because there's good, that one and then year, below but, good is average, but his one and good, below average is bad. His best year. Stop living in extremes. So look, two years, right? Two years that you want to claim that are okay, right? One of which was last year where they basically made the offense idiot-proof to the point where he could execute it. Right? We've had this discussion before. In order to make him viable, they turned the offense into such a ridiculous it wasn't like, that, childhood example of an offense that any quarterback could have run it. That, no, we it. We had that discussion that ex- last it week. It wasn't that extreme. It really was. There was a lot of games We like had the that. discussion last week where basically Cody Kessler would have been a better option within that offense, given how idiot-proof they made it. The other season was the season that was 100% driven by Allen Robinson and Allen Hearns. We just talked about before receivers making a guy look good. So you've got two seasons, both of which are more explained by things outside of Blake Bortles' control than they were by Blake Bortles. The The two seasons where you actually asked him to be an independently good quarterback, he graded badly. The stats were inflated a little bit in 2015, but he still played better than average that year. Average to slightly above average that year. He did the same (laughs) last year overall. He did have a stretch. Look, and this is why I'm saying I'm not buying in, because 
you just can't live in this good good or bad. Everybody's good or bad. I'm not. I'm You're saying like politics right now. No, no. I'm not living in everybody is good or bad. I'm living in Blake Bortles is bad. He's not bad. There's Deshaun Kaiser last year was bad. What we saw of him so far this year was no, bad. Deshaun Kaiser last year was terrible. Abysmal. So in your Horrific. world, there's good, bad, and terrible? I mean, there's more than one of these things, Steve. That's the idea of a spectrum of play. You're, beg- you're begging to bring back nuance. You want to bring back nuance, yes. and then you just won't apply it. No, I'm applying it. I'm just suggesting play. there's more of the spectrum than good or bad or terrible. There's like a whole spectrum of things. Correct. And Kaiser Bortles is, is above horrific. Bad. And Bortles is above the Kaiser is horrific. Spectrum. Bortles is better than horrific, but still bad. He's not. And th- th- you know what? I don't think Cody Kessler puts together a game like Bortles did yesterday. No, he probably doesn't. But he puts together games that Bortles did last year. That was my point. They managed to, in order to get Bortles functioning at an average level last year, they basically turned the offense into a Fisher Price version of an NFL offense. Great. All that said, all that said, I don't think Bortles is necessarily good either or as good as he showed yesterday so yeah there was a four game stretch last year where we 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 had the same discussion ah did he turn the corner the difference is when does this stuff happen when it happens at the beginning of the year you like to make these you know grand you know explanations of oh things have completely changed you had an off season then you see something new for two to four games and you want to call it new but if that happens you know weeks 13 through 15 it just you know, it's just when they happen. Yeah. Last year, Bortles' four game stretch happened. You know, week ten or, or if it, it happens was. on the, like fresh off the back of seven terrible games, like you're already so far in the hole in terms of negative equity of the perception on your play, it doesn't make a difference. But if it happens week one, week two, it looks great. So he, so here's what I'm saying about quarterback play. I think there's a bunch of there's 25, maybe 28 quarterbacks in the league that probably land closer to average than they do bad. That they're much clo- they're closer to average than they are bad. And when you have that, and this is what I was talking about before the season, especially when Brady either, you know, gets older and Breeze is gone, especially when the high the guys at the high end or Aaron Rodgers if he re- ever regresses because he's getting older, once those guys disappear, you're going to have this wide open crazy NFL where there's nobody sitting atop the quarterback rankings except maybe Patrick Mahomes. Mahomes is going to be the next great one. It's just going to be a whole bunch of guys who, in any given year, anything can happen. Like I don't, I'm not sold that Carson Wentz is a top ten quarterback every year, top five quarterback every year. Well, no, we, we were talking about this with Watt. People are ready to throw Watson in the top ten. He's not there yet. No, but this is a sample size thing, right? This is what happens when you get young quarterbacks after one year. Who knows? Okay, that's impressive. Do it again. You do it again. You know, you do it five years in a row. Now we can start talking about Aaron Rodgers. We just haven't seen, like, we're between, we're almost between generations at the moment where the next wave of young quarterbacks, they just haven't had the time yet to actually show what they are. Now, maybe they won't ever get there, and maybe you'll have this weird dystopian post-NFL future that you're talking about, or maybe these guys at that point will have put together three or four years of really good play, and you'll be talking about an NFL where instead of Rodgers, Breeze, Brady, it's Wentz, Mahomes, Whatever. Yeah, it might be. I mean, look, I'm looking forward to seeing how it uh, how it shakes out. Speaking of quarterbacks, maybe taking the next step, you get Kirk Cousins in Minnesota. What a fascinating game this was. 29-29 tie with the Green Bay Packers, which was fitting. I think both teams are very even. So other than the kicker screwing it up, that was the, the Kirk Cousins game that we talked about, which is he can bring you back in a way Bradford and Keenum aren't really capable of doing, which is – a, a significant deficit against a good team where you need to score a few times late to make it happen with some big throws. Like there's a, that high volatile thing that we talked about before. Those are the guys that are capable of executing that comeback. Yes. Now they may not have put you in the hole in the first place, or they may be the reason, sorry, that you're in the hole in the first place, or um, they may cause you in other games, they may cause you to lose because they make the big mistake that the other guy wouldn't have made. But that is the game essentially that you're paying for when you decide to go for that variety of quarterback. It is, we're down a few scores against a good team. We need a guy that can make throws that you guys can't make to pull this game back. And it really happened. Kirk Cousins made some insane throws late in the game. Got kind of lucky on one that fit through a stupidly tight window. The Adam Thielen touchdown? Yeah, because the safety basically bailed on it. Um, I thought that was awesome, though. It was a great play, but the safety should have broken that up. Hmm. Um, he literally, I, I have sympathy for him because 
it's one of those ones where in order to make that play, you have to sacrifice your body and understand that you're probably going to die, which is, you know, not an easy thing for safety to admit is going to happen. Sure. But if he'd stuck his hands out there and dived headlong at it, he would have broken the pass up. It's just the two bodies are coming at him as he was doing that. So it would have hurt a lot. I thought it was just great to see you've got Cousins game on the line. I remember tweeting, all right, it's Cousins time, right? We paid all this money to get him. He's got a chance to drive down. They're down five. Has a chance to drive down and win the game. First pass, accurate, dropped, pick. Mm. There were a lot of Vikings fans who were like, see? Cousins always throws the pick at the key time. Like, wasn't even on him. Yeah. Then the Packers kick a field goal. So now they're up eight. And Cousins has two minutes now. And two minutes is really an, inter- an eternity in today's NFL. It's two flags away from being a field goal range, by the way. So Cousins has a chance to fix it. He heaves one up. I do think this was a bad decision. He was feeling the pressure. He was getting hit. Chucks one up for an interception to end the game when the Clay Matthews call happens to keep the game alive. Roughing yeah. the passer. And then Cousins is spectacular down the stretch. I mean, the thing about all of the... The thing about an NFL game is it's only, what, like 70 plays long on average for an offense? Yeah. We on one side of the ball. It's 70 plays. And so for a start, that's a pretty small sample size where you do anything. Then you're talking about single plays that can completely change the outcome of what's happening. So an interception versus a catch, you know, a dropped intercept, all these kind of things. One play completely changes the way a thing is going. It, it 100% alters the narrative. You think about it like Back to the Future, you know, the Back to the Future movies. One decision completely changes the future. And you go from like regular future to weird dystopian future where Biff is the mayor or whatever he was. By one play. That's that's what you're talking about in a football game. Whether the ball is caught, whether it's intercepted, whether it's dropped, all these things completely change the path that an NFL game is taking and the perception on the quarterback because he's the guy that gets blamed for all of this, whichever way it's going. So it's kind of amazing. You get these one plays, you think, well, that didn't happen, so it didn't count. But it, it, would, it would fundamentally alter the way these things are happening. Can we also talk, by the way, about why kickers suck so much? I didn't want to talk about kickers on the show, but they're they uh, today awful. I guess they deserve some mention. Daniel Carlson was a fifth round draft pick, and like kickers don't tend to be drafted. So if you take a guy in the fifth round, you better believe you are saying this guy is an exceptional kicker. He was zero for three yesterday. None of them were over fifty yards, and I think all three of them were missed wide right, including that last one to win the game, which was effectively an extra point range. What about Zane? That was bad, too. But I think Carlson takes the biscuit. Which Who's our, who's our lowest graded kicker of the week, Steve? Oh, man. Well, so Zane was 0 for 2. Yeah. Uh, well, 2 for 4 total, but 0 for 2 at four, uh, in the 40 and 50 plus range. But was it two extra points he missed? Uh, Zane, at the moment, Zane is, in fact, uh, leading Carlson for the worst kicker of the week. Boswell's up there as well. Poor Zane. There was some bad kicking on display. There was. But that, I mean... So I said that, you know, uh, Dan Bailey probably made a million bucks sitting on his ass yesterday just because he didn't miss those kicks. He didn't. He's going to be sitting there waiting for all the phone calls to roll in this morning going, yeah, I mean, you're going to have to, you know, there's a few teams on the line. You're going to have to tempt me with a pretty big offer to get off my couch and roll in there. Oh, man. We had to talk about kickers have to be really bad for them to even make it onto the show. Yeah. And 0 for 3, like game defining kicks. That's pretty bad. The well, Browns, Zane, cost the Browns a win against the Saints. The Browns who basically can't win games. So they did a really, first off, I think Baker, Baker changes that offense. They <laughs> score a lot more points. You texted me and you said Tyrod sucks after he threw his interception, right? Yep. What happened after that? Incredible throw to Antonio Callaway. There you go. Incredible. Big time throw. Um, still Baker Mayfield, because we go back to this. What is Tyrod Taylor? He's an avoid the negatives guy rather than an add the positives guy in yeah. PFF terms. Though he's also stopped doing that, which is kind of weird. Well, that too in the last couple weeks. But I'm just saying over time, look, guys still are who they are. Okay, let's not overreact to two weeks. <laughs> Baker Mayfield goes in there and he adds a ton of value to that team. The Browns defense through two games is really good. Like, you know, making Roethlisberger look terrible with four picks. And I know those don't, it's tough to sustain. But they had Drew Brees looking really uncomfortable on third downs. Blitz is coming from everywhere, sacking them. 
defense looked pretty good. Larry Ogunjobi bringing the pass rush. I need to see Baker Mayfield versus Sam Donald on Thursday Night Football. Do not trot Tyrod out there again. Leave Tyrod alone. Larry Ogunjobi, by the way, was looking like Miles Garrett for stretches of that game. He's yeah. supposed to be like the big run defender, bringing all kinds of pass rush. He's just good overall. Let's just, you want to just fly through the rest of the league real quick? No, but sure. Well, not the rest, but just the other key stories. Rams 34 nothing against the Cardinals. Cardinals didn't even get into Rams territory until their, what, second to last play? Yeah. Our guy Mike Renner said, I keep to leave. Already looks like the steal of the offseason. Completely agree. I mean, one of them, sure. That, the, that, uh, the Cardinals just, oh, they were depressing. That was my pick last week. Worst team in the league. They're yeah. looking bad. I mean, them, yeah, it's, it's the Cardinals or the Bills, right? And the Bills at least mounted some kind of comeback. The Cardinals just laid over and died and took a beating. I've always wanted to just believe in Sam Bradford, right? You but know, I told you. But I told you when he goes to the – but he needs a perfect situation, right? He, the same thing we're talking about these other guys. To go to the Cardinals, which has a bad offensive line and bad playmakers, was just a recipe for disaster. We're going to be seeing Josh, Josh Rosen very soon. You know soon. what the Cardinals reminded me of in that game? You ever see the end of an MMA UFC fight where a guy has reached the point where he's done and he's just turtled up with his hands over his head, just taking the beating until the official steps in and goes, no, no, we're done. We're done. Step back. Desist. The beating. It's over. That's what happened yesterday. I mean, no officials no officials were there to pull the Rams off the prone corpse of the Arizona Cardinals and just stop the beating happening. Yeah. They're, they're not good. That doesn't seem like an ideal situation for a football team. They're not good. Uh, the Giants and Saquon Barkley scored 13 points. Yeah. How many broken tackles did Saquon Barkley have in that game? Because it seemed like every time he touched the ball, he was breaking a tackle. And it didn't matter. 11, yard, uh, 11 carries for 28 yards, forced one missed tackle. They were all on reception. On the so. ground. Let, me, let me dial that up for you. Receiving. Uh, we got to go to his. You gotta go I got to it. Data. I got it. You keep talking. Uh, so, um, going back to what was our play? Eight. Uh, eight broken tackles on receptions, on 14 receptions. It still didn't matter much. I uh, saw so our boy JJ over at, uh, I don't know, is he at Number Fire or something right now? I retweeted him because he was, he's in this. Uh, there's a lot of people that study NFL from a number standpoint that are on this running backs are overrated train. Mm -hmm. JJ is one of the guys that are on there. Zach Zachariasen? Zachariasen? I hate pronouncing names. Mm. But he had a good, I retweeted him earlier today because he said, the people that are coming at me about Barkley are blaming the offensive line. Mm -hmm. And he said, yes, the point. that's the point. Yeah, that's been, uh, that's been the entire point. The whole time. Yeah. Running backs can't make a running game by themselves. And also, this was kind of, I mean, this was this was the effect we expected him to have, right? He was a dynamic receiver in that game, made a lot of things happen, broke a, about eight tackles on 14 receptions, which in and of itself is an insane number. And the Giants couldn't score, essentially, until late in the game. So... Like, it's entirely the point, right? He had 14 catches, 80 yards, broke eight tackles, was the only guy giving Dallas any kind of trouble on defense, and it didn't make any impact whatsoever to the Giants being able to deal with anything in that game. So if you take away the one 68-yard touchdown run last week, which is great, this is what Saquon Barkley does, Uh huh. 28 carries yeah. for 66 yards. Yeah, that's not good. That's 2.4 yards per carry but the point i think even the even bigger point is even when you factor in what he can do as a receiver which is high-end running back stuff right it's up there with Le'Veon bell with alvin kamara with with christian mccaffrey with all these receiving dynamic weapons it's not making any difference it doesn't matter yeah like even not. when you factor in the thing that should be his differentiator it's not it doesn't matter it doesn't make a difference can i tweet this out real quick i need to can you can you spend some time while i tweet something out uh, oh, it's on my mind. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah I mean, that's, that's the overall point, right? Is that Saquon Barkley, for as dynamic a weapon as he is, and as good a player and athlete as he is, that was, I think, the thing that stood out, is that, you, again, you get these guys that are special athletes. When they hit the NFL level, when you're able to embarrass NFL-caliber athletes on defense, you're something pretty special. And his spin move, in particular, was just leaving Dallas Cowboys defenders grasping at thin air all game long. The whole point with this Saquon Barkley stuff and the value aspect of it is even when he is doing all that, it just doesn't matter. The biggest, the biggest differentiator in terms of having success on the ground is how well you're blocking, when you dial it up, you know, versus box counts, etc. It's not. It's independent of the running back that's the guy actually carrying the ball. It's how you dial it up. It's how your run blocking does. There's so many different. But again, going back to yesterday's ridiculous explosive day in the NFL 
where the average passer rating was better than Aaron Rodgers' career passer rating, Mm -hmm. that's what's going to win games for you, is being good in the pass game and stopping the pass. And it goes back to the Jaguars. The Jaguars have a legitimate pass defense. The Rams have a legitimate pass defense. The few teams that can come out of this, the the few teams that can stand out as having legit pass defenses in this pass-heavy NFL, they're the ones that give themselves a chance to win it all. That three, was the Broncos in 2015. Three running backs yesterday had more than 10 catches. Yeah, so McCaffrey, Barkley. I don't know who the third one was. Oh. I was looking for you to help. No, I was teeing you up. I thought you were going to oh, no. you were gonna knock it right out of the park there. No. No, you were just going to swing two. and miss on the third. Uh, Chris Thompson and Theo Riddick at nine. So okay. almost four backs, 10 catches. I mean, that's the way to use those guys. That's fine. Yeah. But, uh, but that, I mean, that's the way the league is going, is that you need a running back that is a legitimate part of your passing offense. Yeah, it just, you just want, I really think you want to spread the field with a number of unique playmakers. You need to go up and get it guy, contested catch guy, you want a yak guy, you want a good route runner, you want all those different things. And then defensively, you need to be able to match up with that. Yeah. Whether you're playing zone or man, you just you need to be able to match up with a running back who can catch out of the backfield, a tall tight end, a tall wide receiver, a shifty wide receiver. You just need to be able to match up with that on both ends. And the teams that can do that the best are going to be the best teams at the end. Pr- pretty profound. Nice, yeah. Pass the ball, stop the pass. Uh, did you, did you want to do a captain reading this week? or I think we saved save the captain for reading for the, uh, for the preview podcasts. Anything else general? So, the other, so here's the one other thing. Before the season, I don't want to brag about – you don't want to brag about everything. It's two weeks in, right? But yeah, preseason go picks. against what we just said. But no, I'm just saying preseason picks that we are looking good on so far. Texans being 0 2, Giants being 0 2. We did not like their rosters in general. Not a good star for either mm-hmm. team. And Deshaun Watson did it did end up with a pretty good statistical statistical game. But man, <laughs> poor awareness at the end of the game. He's still throwing those downfield passes that last year were jump ball it, touchdowns. They're becoming interceptions. So there are some some things around the league just kind of regressing back to where they should be well watson is a classic example of what we were talking about before which is you don't know yet seven games yeah. is just not long enough to understand what a quarterback is and now with mahomes too it's the same yeah, yeah i mean it's the same like it's what we said now it's it's still only two games three plus last year plus preseason blah blah again it's the same issue all of the data points we have so far on mahomes say he's really good but it is just those data points like if fitzpatrick started this year and this is all we knew about him We'd be like, this is the next great quarterback, but it's Fitzpatrick, and we're pretty sure that at some point it's going to come crashing down to earth in a great big heap. Um, like the same deal with Deshaun Watson. It was a bit longer. It was seven games or whatever it was, but there were numbers we had that said, okay, he is not as good as he looks right now. The you know the the supporting cast stuff, the lack of drop passes, just every number we had says this is unsustainable. This is coming back down to earth at some point. And, and we never got a chance to see it happen last year because he got hurt. This year, it looks like it's happening. I mean, just the idea that he was winning MVP this year was farcical. Like anybody saying that before the season clearly doesn't understand how the world works or is just looking for clicks, right? Yeah, you were looking at, I oh, had 104 passer rating last year in seven games as a rookie. He's spectacular, not understanding the context. Or of just where those in games seven are. games, he looks spectacular. Therefore, that will clearly continue next year because why would it do anything else? Like I, That's just foolish. I'll also say, though, the difference between him and Mahomes is Mahomes is putting up spectacular stats and grading well, yes. whereas Watson graded okay oh. with ridiculous stats. That is the biggest thing. The grading context generally matches up with stats over time yeah right as much if you if you look at 10-year grades versus 10-year stats you're, you're going to get in the ballpark small sample size the other thing is no. mahomes has got a hell of a lot of a better situation than oh the situation Deshaun watson had. incredible you're talking about an offensive line that's fine you're talking about receiving weapons that are off the charts you know uh watson basically just had new copkins and that's it um so receiving options are off charts decent offensive line like everything is falling into place for mahomes like you looked at the rest of the texans team you're like if nothing else this is a reason why he's going to regress not the other way around yeah absolutely well i think that'll do it for us today sam we got through as much as we could we did we did Uh, there's a lot more to come youtube channel will hit up some of the other big stories don't forget the pff nfl show on youtube we try to hit the biggest stories around the league if you guys are watching the podcast on youtube hi thanks if you guys are listening through podcast one we appreciate it we're getting some 
great traction in recent weeks so we appreciate all of the listeners old and new don't forget to get to profootballfocus.com get your pff elite package to get all of the grades and stats with premium stats 2.0 and all your picks from pff green line what are you what are you laughing at over just you were saying that for this podcast we should read the analyst insights chat I just think one day we should do that verbatim to get the kind of messages that Ben drops in there that we would have to censor. Oh, gosh. What did he put in here? <laughs> can I read the Lions one? Yeah. I think we can go. We can get one not safe for work so message just, in there. Just so you know, as our guys are going through the games, they're grading, they're regrading, they're whatever it is. We have a chat just to get because it, you truly can't get insights <laughs> like this anywhere else from our play-by-play <laughs> grading. And this is the way I'm pitching it. And now this I'm one hear possibly what ben has to you can get elsewhere. Ben simply messaged, Lions defensive line can't get in their gaps for shit. <laughs> I, I, just, I mean, that's, that's, it? that's the kind of insight you can't get anywhere else, Steve. That's why we have that chat up there and running. I, I agree. I, I've, I wasn't wild in your idea to begin with, but now I think we should just start reading this to people on the podcast. Okay, so maybe on that's Thursday, it. maybe the Thursday preview, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll hop back into the... We'll, we'll maybe censor it a little bit. No, I, th- I, no I, I think we just read it verbatim. I think that's even better. There were better defensive fronts put out in preseason week two. <laughs> oh, that's not good. There's a lot of... Um, there's a little bit of Lions hate in here. Well, that, that's on brand. Ragnow, right? Glasgow. Oh, man, Ragnow's bumming me out. Kudos to Deshaun Watson for managing to turn a play with 17 seconds left into the final play of the game. <laughs> that was pretty spectacular. Here's a positive. So we're hit, this is how we hit every team. The burst Albert Wilson showed on his 29-yard touchdown yesterday was, um, was hearts around the head emoji. Okay. That's love. That's yeah. love from Gordon McGinnis. I, yeah, ben, I was, I was generally done. negative. I was just done just with that Lions defensive line one. Now I'm having fun. Darnold rolling it back to his college days with that Q1 interception. Completely not seeing a guy basically standing still over the middle of the field. That seems to happen quite a lot in the NFL. Ben also says Quentin Nelson's biggest adjustment, adjustment to the NFL seems to be dealing with the fact that he's not the biggest, baddest MFer on yeah. the field anymore. I mean, that's fair, right? Yeah. Okay, the analyst chat does bring something. And look at that. All of a sudden, we tapped into the Lions, the Jets, and the Colts. We added that to the mix. Oh, yeah, nice. And we'll hit on every team later in the week, previewing week three. Thanks to everybody for listening. We'll see you guys later in the week with the week three preview.